There's perhaps no greater mystery in the annals of pro wrestling than the career of the Ultimate Warrior, a man whose mystique was built around a flashy ring entrance and a cool look equally defined by his erratic behavior and sudden and bizarre exits. I feel like every time I examine his career on this channel, I'm left with more questions and answers. Questions like, why would someone with the wrestling world at his fingertips throw it away so often? How could this man make it so far and be given opportunity after opportunity despite an arguable lack of ability and a negative backstage attitude? And you know what? I'm still trying to figure out what the hell distrucity means. In the years since his passing, the Ultimate Warrior's first run in the Federation has been glorified to the utmost, blazing through the Honky Tonk Man to become the Intercontinental Champion, beating Hulk Hogan in an all-time Mania Classic, and becoming the presumed heir to the throne. Unfortunately, it didn't stick. A mere year and a half after Mania 6, Warrior was suspended for holding Vincent Mann up for money at SummerSlam 91, and almost sat out the rest of his contract before coming back at WrestleMania 8. This return wound up being an abbreviated one as Warrior left the company six months later. The true reason as to why has never been made truly clear, but the gist of it is something something drugs. Yes, the early 90s are quite a ride for the Warrior, but what the company talks about a whole lot less, at least now that they don't try to crap on him all the time, is his far less successful run just a few years later. See, by the mid-90s, WCW was causing all sorts of headaches for Vince McMahon, but he knew what he needed to fight the enemy. A big star from the past. Yes, it was time to once again embrace the proven, battle-tested performers who carried the banner for the company in the good old days. Huh. Feels like kind of a mixed signal to court the warrior for a comeback after spending months beating into fans' heads that the old days were a bad thing. Honestly, it was kind of a break for the Federation. WCW could have signed him if they wanted to, but hey, they already had the Ultimate Warrior at home. <laughs> Nevertheless, the wheels were in motion for the return of the Warrior. Apparently, the original plan was for him to come back at that year's Royal Rumble, a show that also saw the return of Jake Roberts and the debut of Vader. But his financial demands and his insistence on using a prescribed testosterone patch stalled talks. But when Kevin Nash and Scott Hall were on their way to the greener pastures of Atlanta, McMahon was forced to face a future without two of his biggest draws, no doubt speeding up the negotiation process. Warrior was given a deal that was unheard of at the time, $1 million for 18 months. Brock Lesnar laughed in that contract, stupid face. Fast forward to March of 1996, Anaheim, California, WrestleMania 12, where our hero made his big return against a plucky young upstart by the name of Hunter Hearst Helmsley. The match would become a defining moment for the former Frenchman of WCW, just not in the way anyone could have hoped. See, the original plan was for there to be a competitive match, but Warrior famously shot that idea down the day of the show, turning it into a total squash match that barely passed the 90 second mark. I'll give credit where it's due, the crowd was a lot more into this match than, say, the very boring main event, so I guess it was smart on his part to cut to the chase and conceal his shortcomings. Still, you have to feel bad for the young Triple H, as he had the rug pulled out from under him at his first WrestleMania. Hey, uh, Triple H, how do you feel about what happened that night? I got to find out how big of a one the ultimate warrior really is. Probably one of the most unprofessional guys I've ever stepped into the ring with. Yeah, I totally get that, man. And uh, Triple H, do you care to comment as well? For me to go to my first WrestleMania and wrestle a legendary figure in the business, uh, squash or not, was a mind-blowing thing for me. I see, I see. Um, oh, Triple H, it looks like you have something you want to say? It was great on one hand, but he ruined the experience for me on the other hand. Okay, um, Triple H, your rebuttal? A lot of people bring it up to me as if it was a sore spot in my career. It's not. It's actually something I'm really proud of. Uh... Very interesting. Strangely enough, it was Hunter's valet that night, Sable, who would end up being the biggest star of the three over the next few years, but something tells me that Helmsley kid turned out okay. Warrior would get a little more to chew on the next week on Raw as he was immediately put in a feud with the Intercontinental Champion, Goldust. Hold it right there, freak! <laughs> Takes one to know one. And whatever you're into, I don't give a sh I got a full-length movie for you. Me kicking your ass from beginning to end. Damn, Attitude Era's coming early over here. While cussing in a promo if you're not Steve Austin generally reeks of desperation, for Warrior it did add a human touch that was desperately needed. As far as the rest of the build went, how about this completely normal promo that does not in any way come off like some sort of disturbing sexual threat? There's going to be squealing gold dust, and you're going to be the biggest squealing pig of all. <laughs> Every single female wrestler in the last 20 years has received some variation of that comment online. On a European tour following WrestleMania, Goldust tore up his knee. It's unclear what the original plan for their pay-per-view match was, or if they truly considered putting the IC belt on Warrior once more. But as derivative as that might have been, it would have been preferable to what we got. 
Getting ready! With Goldust unable to work an actual match, not that it ever stopped the warrior, hey -o. instead the two dicked around for nearly 10 minutes of pay-per-view time. They put Mantar in a suit and made him a nameless bodyguard so that someone could eat some clotheslines. The segment finally ended when Warrior convinced Goldie to put on his robe and sit in the director's chair before burning his hand with Marlena's cigar and chasing Goldust out, resulting in a count-out win. At least there weren't any balloons this time. Between this and his match with Helmsley one month earlier, it became clear that this presentation of the Warrior was going to be a bit different than before. By this time, Warrior in and of himself had become a full-grown spectacle to watch. Whether he actually wrestled or not was irrelevant. It's not unlike how they've used Goldberg the last few years. Though he seemed to be more human in 1996 than he was in 1990, to see him like this at In Your House almost felt out of character. The Warrior of 88 would have thrown Goldust back into the ring, hit a line a splash, and the ref would have counted the three. Bingo, bango, fans are happy. There are a lot of ways you could have taken this segment. In fact, they could have cooked up any other scenario, and it probably wouldn't have been as awkward, drawn out, or boring as what they ended up doing. Warrior dancing with Phil Collins was more graceful than this. As the weeks passed, Warrior began feuding with color commentator Jerry Lawler, which is always a really good sign your career is going places. In his first ever match on Raw in late April, yes, fans had to wait a full month to see him actually wrestle on the USA Network, Warrior easily dispatched of Lawler's personal dentist, Isaac Yankum, in a traditional Warrior-style match. Another scenario in this saga where you might have lost some money if you were asked to bet on who of these guys would be a bigger star in three years. The company seemed to embrace a less-is-more philosophy when it came to Warrior, as he wrestled almost exclusively on house shows, most notably in a series of 30 second squashes with Vader. But that didn't mean there was any less emphasis on him. No, no, no. This is where the second facet of his contract kicked in. The door to Warrior University could quite possibly lead into the dressing rooms of the WWF superstars. I believe you can turn your fantasy into an ultimate reality. To lower Warrior's guarantee, the company agreed to partner in Warrior University, his wrestling school in Arizona he opened a year earlier. As I've mentioned before on this channel, they produced some well-done commercials for the school, even if you had no idea what they were actually selling. Some aspire to a more profound goal. Anyone desperate enough to try and deceive a blind man needs the money more than I. Unleash the warrior inside you and accomplish the impossible. Well, it's a better sell than learn three moves, get blown up before the bell rings, and piss off all your colleagues for a monthly fee. Around this time, Dubs was also exploring other media to spread his gospel, in particular, comic books. In all, five issues of the Ultimate Warrior comic were released to the masses, all penned by the warrior himself. And if you believe what the Federation was saying, it was selling like gangbusters. Talk about his comic book. It's unbelievable. Curly, the number one selling comic book in the entire world. Oh! Well, of course it was, since the WWF was apparently buying as much as 100,000 copies of his comic book every month and just giving them away at shows. Companies buying books in bulk to jack up the numbers is an all too common practice in the literary world and is why you sometimes see a little icon like this next to a title on a bestseller list. Basically, it's an asterisk. If you honestly thought there was a genuine demand for Warriors two-dimensional ramblings in 1996, then I guess you didn't hear of a little thing called the DC Marvel crossover series. Make it happen in the movies, you cowards! In all honesty though, I've only heard some things about the Warriors comic books, but I never took the time to actually sit down and read some of the... What is that monster doing to Santa Claus? The program with Lawler went into high gear as we headed toward, you know what, I just gotta look at this weird shit again. Uh, give me until the end of the break, okay? My god, I need a shower and a brain bleach. Warrior and Goldust met in a rematch on Raw in the first round of the King of the Ring tournament, and while there was still a whole lot of shtick, at least it was an actual match this time. I'm very perplexed by what happened with this finish. This time, both guys get counted out, but then Lawler gets up from his post near the end and awkwardly tries to sneak up on the Warrior, which leads to an awkward chase around the ring. Was it a botch? Was it by design? You decide! Two weeks later, Lawler and Warrior met face to face. The King, who's actually a talented artist outside the ring, took offense to the fact that Warrior didn't approach him to illustrate his deranged comic book. Lawler made a peace offering on Raw with a lovely oil painting of the Warrior and asked his rival to come on down to accept it. Oh, I see that uh, Warrior's playing with the settings on his avatar this week. 
Except maybe for the university commercials and this one moment in your house, you'd be hard pressed to find any evidence of the Ultimate Warrior ever wearing a hat, and certainly not to cut a promo. The interview is to end with Lawler bashing the framed picture over Warrior's head, causing glass to shatter everywhere. For whatever reason, Warrior didn't trust Lawler to do it safely, so he wore the hat for protection. But in doing so, the words on his lid might as well have read, Swing frame here. It was a huge telegraph that something was going to come into contact with his dome, otherwise why wear it? UW's resistance to even basic levels of cooperation killed any heat the angle might have had, and by the pay-per-view it was more apparent than ever just how square of a peg Warrior was in the round hole that was the WWF. Even if Warrior had a hard time going along with the story, at least Lawler could be counted on to piss off the fans that night in Milwaukee. I saw him while ago back in the bathroom, he was getting a drink of water, and then the seat fell and hit him on the head. <laughs> it's girls like you that turn men into, well, people like gold dust. King used every old school Memphis heel trick in the book, attacking Warrior with a scepter and choking him with ring tape, but fans weren't buying that he had a chance of beating the almighty Warrior, to which they were correct. But the crowd did perk up at the end of the show when he made the save for Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson to set up a six-man tag team match against Camp Cornette at the next In Your House pay-per-view. And then... It is with great reluctance that I announce the indefinite suspension of the Ultimate Warrior. Soon after King of the Ring, the law of diminishing returns finally reared its ugly face painted head as Warrior began no showing live events. Apparently, he was none too thrilled to see the company had used his always believe slogan on non Warrior materials at the annual Nappy convention, one of the biggest gatherings in the television industry. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. Was it too much of them to do a little bit of extra promotion? Perhaps their partnership with your university and their agreement to buy thousands of copies of your batshit insane comic books wasn't enough to sweeten the deal? Warrior had claimed that his no-shows were due to the death of his father, but even if it wasn't already known that he hadn't been close to his dad in years, that doesn't explain the fact that his dad died two days after the first no-show. Well, the power of the Warrior does transcend all space and time, so maybe he was just jumping the gun? The issue with The Ultimate Warrior was addressed in the July 8th episode of Raw by KFA president Gorilla Monsoon. Not only did the company publicly call him out on his failures to appear, they also said he'd have to pay a ludicrous quarter million dollar appearance bond to resume his date to the company. Geez, and here I thought Indy Greenhorns having to sell tickets to get booked was rough. But even though the Federation effectively washed its hands of the Warrior, they did have one more match in the can from this taping, a bout against Owen Hart airing right after Monsoon's statement. So to recap, the Warrior is suspended, but here he is wrestling this match while under suspension. What, did he pay the money? Not only was it objectively his best match all year, it was a testament to Owen's ability in the ring. He and Warrior had been road partners when they were starting out in the WWF in the late 80s, which may partly explain why Warrior sold so well for Owen in the match. But the WWF couldn't have cared less about match quality, instead using this opportunity to record some new commentary with the explicit intent of writing Warrior off. It sure was lucky they also had a Camp Cornette beatdown and carryout after the match to help sell the story. I told you this was going to happen, McMahon. It's great. Hey, goodbye, Warrior. <laughs> In the end, Michaels and Johnson chose their replacement partner in the form of Psycho Sid, which not only blessed us with an amazing Cornette reaction gif, but also proved there's someone out there with even worse talking ability than the master and ruler of the world. Well, first of all, anybody that walked down the aisle with Sean and Michael or Matt Johnson got to be able to hold his own. And that was, at least for the next 18 years, the end of the warrior in the WWF. You know, in hindsight, it's almost as though they loaded the spaceship with the rocket fuel, shoved the controls into a nosedive, and pushed this entire run to self-destruction from the beginning. Part of the Warrior's problem in his first run was that his character was very inflexible and incompatible with an evolving business. Hulk Hogan's character was similar in many ways, but at least he had a human charm about him to make up for it. But now the character is six years past its peak, with about a year to go before the Federation hauls off in a completely different direction. The work of guys like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels was the new normal in the company, effectively rendering the Warrior obsolete. Even if he had stayed for the full 18 months of his deal, by the end, nothing about his presence there would have made any sense. Good he fit right in with WCW two years later. Beyond the nostalgia pop, after a while there just wasn't anywhere for Warrior to go. You couldn't move him down the card and he was too unreliable to be a top guy again. In many ways, by the time the Warrior had come back, The Undertaker had already filled a role that would have been perfect for him. An unworldly character babyface who was involved in programs that were separate but equal to the main event. 
I mean, other people would say, why did you keep bringing this nutcase back? It's rare that Vincent Mann comes out looking sympathetic when it comes to talent relations, but that's definitely the case when it comes to Warrior. Despite being burned twice before in 91 and 92, Vince brought him back with all the fanfare of a returning legend, giving him a series of opponents that were essentially layups, allowing him to squash his new main event heel and house shows, and even humored Warrior's desire to expand into other venues by supporting his side project. Warrior repaid him by indulging in the same defensive, self-sabotaging, self-destructive egotism that halted his previous two runs and ultimately only harmed himself. Oh, hey, I think I finally figured out what destrucity means.